All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Paige Wittick and I'm the education coordinator for the Missouri River Bird Observatory, which is the organization that's putting on this webinar for you guys today. Um, so I just wanted to welcome you to, this will be intermediate birding. Um, and the first thing I wanna go over are just some technical things before we get into what we're gonna be talking about today. So if you move your mouse, um, you, or tap your screen, you'll see it should be three buttons. You'll have a Q&A button, a raise your hand button, and a chat function. Um, so that Q&A button is if you have any questions that you wanna ask any of the panelists today. Um, we're gonna hold questions till the end, um, but if you feel you have a question that you um, need answered in that moment, feel free to put that in that box. Um, and we will monitor that and answer that when appropriate. Um, and we'll and we'll get to it. Um, if you the raise your hand, um, we the panelists may ask you a question. Um, be like, does anybody know what this bird is? And you can press that raise your hand button, and that'll be a way to interact as well. And then there's the chat function, and we're mainly going to use that function to share some links with you guys. Um, and there will be a period where Dana will ask you guys a question that she'll want you to answer. Right now, when you type in that chat function, it only goes to us, the panelists and not the other attendees. So let's get started. <laughs> so our presenters today, so this is me, Paige Wittick. I'm the education coordinator for the organization and I'm just gonna act as a host today. Then Dana Ripper is our director and co-founder and she's gonna talk to you guys a little bit about sparrows and field marks. Um, and then Zeb Yoko, our conservation science communicator, is going to talk to you guys about some bird and song call identification. And Ethan Duke, our co-director and co-founder, is also going to talk to you guys about more about song identification. So we're really going to cover um, some of the basics of that today, which will be really exciting. <laughs> So uh, this is our mission statement, um, and essentially, essentially what all those words mean is that we work to help birds and we do that in a variety of ways. So one thing we do is we work to provide quality habitats for birds. We work to towards sustainable agriculture. That's what feeding the flock refers to. We work to provide bird friendly communities. And what we're doing today is hoping to get people out in nature um, and experiencing it and connecting with it. If you want to learn more about what each of these eggs means, um, you can visit our website, mrbo.org, and I'll put that in the chat box as well. So let's talk about why birds. Um, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure I don't have to convince any of you that birds are awesome, but let's talk about some reasons. So there's a lot of reasons. So one reason is because they can be just so dang cute, just like this piping plover chick right here. They can be very beautiful in color like this Baltimore Oriole. They can sing beautiful echoey songs like this wood thrush. They can look kind of goofy like this burrowing owl. They can have some pretty crazy dance moves like this greater prairie chicken. They can be literally everywhere like this house sparrow here. And they can have some really, really cool adaptations like this peregrine falcon's ability to fly 240 miles per hour to catch its prey. But those are only some of the reasons. But the main reason, the big reason that we work to help birds is because they're a great connector. They connect us to people all over the world because they'll occupy habitats from the most natural areas to the most urban landscapes. And you can find them almost everywhere. And because they occupy so many different types of spaces and habitats, when we protect birds, we not only protect them in that habitat, but every other species that um, inhabits that certain place, including ourselves that rely on those same natural resources that the birds do. So they really connect us to people all over the world. And that's pretty cool. So in short, why birds? Why protect birds? Uh, because birds are awesome. So what we're talking about today is birding. We're gonna give you guys some tools to increase your birding knowledge so that when you go out, it expands your experience. Um, and it can be something that's really good for your health and very fun. Um, you can do it as a group, but currently in this climate, we recommend something more like the picture on your right here, um, doing it individually or in pairs. It's fun to have a buddy with you and that can also help with your bird ID too, is to have someone else with you to make sure you're not going crazy and that you did hear that bird. 
Um, so what the today is going to kind of look like. So this is our outline. So um, first, Dana is going to go over some birding by sight by looking at field marks. Then we're going to use the sparrow family as an example of how to look at field marks. Then we're going to start with birding by sound and Zeb's going to go over the strategy about how to get started with that. And then he's all and then Ethan is going to talk to you guys about the warbler family and some and how to another way to look at songs and calls. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions. So we've got a pretty fun presentation planned and I hope you guys enjoy it. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Dana so you can start learning more about bird ID. <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. Let's see. My screen should be coming soon. All right, I think that should work. I can see my co presenters nodding. Okay, great, thanks. Um, okay, so intermediate. Bird ID, we all talked about this for a pretty long time. What were, what are some of the important points to present to everyone? Um, and as Paige said, we're going to do a little bit of sight and then we're going to do a little bit of song. Um, so in terms of birding by sight, um, I think we really start to turn a corner with birds when they start really focusing not as much on trying to remember all the different species but by really looking at what we call field marks or identification marks and so one way to practice this because really the only way that anybody gets better at it is to practice in in life is um is to just get quick glimpses of birds and it's not like you have to ask birds to do this for you right they just sometimes give you very very quick glimpses so when they do that um such as um, this little Lacan sparrow that's on the right hand side of the screen, what should you focus on? So we're going to talk about what you should focus on, basically. Um, note that basically everything that I'm going to say assumes that you have binoculars. Um, these are not things that you can really do, you know, by watching birds from some distance without some sort of optic help. Um, and so Paige always says birds are awesome. Um, by the way, sparrows are really awesome. So I chose this family of birds because I really like them and I felt personally very good when during my own birding journey, I got to know sparrows a lot better because I consider them quite difficult at first. But once you get to know them, they really do look very, very different. So what are some to look at? And I'm hoping that everyone um, can basically, as I talk about these things, really look at the pictures that I'm presenting. Um, there are no quizzes. A lot of you were in birding 101. Um, I'm not trying to keep the names of birds from you in this case. Um, I'd like you to try and look at these field marks. If, our, if my or our faces are in the way, you can move things over on your screen in Zoom, just so you know. So this is assuming that you've narrowed it down to a family. So sparrows or woodpeckers or sandpipers, which we'll get into at some point during this webinar series. So once you've narrowed it down to a family, you want to look for patterns and colors on the breast, belly, sides, and flanks. And you can check that out on the fox and song sparrow. And I realize that these two are in different postures. Um, I kind of did that on purpose since that's something that you're going to encounter in the field. Looking at the head area, including the throat, the lores, which is the area in front of the eye between the bill and the eye, um, the eye area itself. Looking at the tail feathers, which sometimes you can, sometimes you can't see them. And then the wings in the back and the patterns and the colors on the wings in the back, including the collar of the bird. And we're just going to go briefly through all of these different things with a few examples. So this is an older field guide, but I think it's really neat because it, it highlights the importance of streaking um, and really looking at the bird and where it is. Um, so I would note that 11 of these species are very, very rarely seen in Missouri. So if you take out 11, um, if you observe whether the breast and belly and sides flanks of a bird are streaked or unstreaked, you have narrowed that way, way down already. 
So let's look at some of that. Um, so body patterns and streaking, you can see the Lincoln Sparrow on the left has a lot of fine streaking. Um, whereas Swamp Sparrow has, it's, it's either coarse or it's not there. Here's another view of the Swamp Sparrow. Now these two species occupy fairly similar habitat. They're both um, lovers of wetlands. Um, and so when you see them kind of skulking around in wetlands and displaying quite secretive behavior, you're gonna get a quick look and you wanna look really fast at um, some of these markings. And so the streaking is one of those main things that differs between these two species. So head patterns. Um, I just think that this is a very, very cute guide. It's also actually very accurate. I'm not suggesting that people start looking at head patterns with this, but it is not wrong. Um, so if you were in Birding 101, you've seen this particular picture before. I like it because I think that it really gives a good view of the things that you should be looking for. So in the head area, is, are there stripes? Are there eye lines? Are there eye rings? Are there spectacles? All of these things are really important. And if you notice them really, really quickly, you're well on your way to IDing a species. So head patterns. Um, here's a couple of our uh, sparrows that winter here in Missouri. Um, we're still seeing them around in small numbers. They should be gone quite soon. But you can see the very, very obvious similarities and differences um, on the heads of these birds. Otherwise, they look pretty similar, right? Um, but you can see the yellow lores on the white-throated sparrow, and obviously it's the reason for its name, the actual white throat, which the white crown doesn't have. But if you were just looking at, oh, there's a black head, on the sparrow, and that's that's really all you noticed without noticing the other characteristics, you might have a hard time when you go back to your field guide or your phone app um, in determining which of the two species it is. I just wanna point out, since this is intermediate birding, just to get a little bit more complicated, um, these are the first year or immature um, plumage of the white crown sparrow and the tan form of the white-throated sparrow. Uh, this isn't, and it isn't a male-female thing in either bird. Uh, in case of the white crown, it's just a younger bird. In the white-throated sparrow, there's two different forms, and you can see these two individuals look even more alike in a lot of ways. And again, if you were just looking at color, you might get a little bit tripped up. So looking at the patterns and what one has on the what the other doesn't. Um, so a little bit more about heads, although in these, these two species, there's some other differences as well. Um, so grasshopper and Hensel sparrow are two really wonderful, very beautiful, if you're lucky enough to get a close glimpse of them, um, species that inhabit our prairies. And this is where I thought it might be kind of fun if folks want to put in the chat just things that they notice that differ between these two. Um, cause you can imagine if you saw these birds from a bit of a distance, they're, they're probably going to look really similar, but since they're sitting here so nicely, um, in photos, we can really examine what's different about them. So if anybody wants to put in the chat, just like a few things off the top of your head that you're seeing that are different. See. Paige, I'm going to ask you to grab those. All right, so we're getting in some comments. So, um, a, so a lot of people are picking up on what you're saying, and they're saying the Henslow has streaks, um, like a streak, streaked breast. Um, another person says eye size. Grasshopper has large eyes. Um, speckled head on left. Um, in relation to stripe. Um, sideburns on Mr. Henslow, I love that. Um, streaks on breast and flanks. Yellow uh, slash tan on Henslow's head. Um, Rufus tinge on Henslow. Yeah, I think those are some great comments. <laughs> Very good, thanks everybody. So you can see from particularly the shape of the head and the shape of the beak, um, I hope you can see that these birds are extremely similar. They are the same genus. Um, They're both Amodramus sparrows, which are 
fairly unique in the Sparrow family for having this like kind of bullet shaped head with long but stout beak. Um, so in this case, if you're if you're in a habitat, these two species, um, you know, silhouette is not really going to help you with these guys, right? They're really really similar silhouette wise. Um, so you need to look at these very fine markings. Um, so you can see here, at first glance, these are really very similar looking birds. Um, so I think you can notice though, since we're now looking at heads, um, that the Vesper Sparrow has a, a lot more of an eye ring. Um, it's known to have a pretty prominent eye ring. And then the Savannah Sparrow, for instance, that yellow lore and a little bit above the eye um, and the eyebrow is very indicative of that species. So you can imagine, again, these birds occupy fairly similar habitats as well. So if you just saw this and you weren't paying attention to the super fine details, um, you would not be able to tell these species apart. So a little bit more um, on back and wing pattern and coloration. So the patterning on the back, these are pretty prominent gray and reddish rufous stripes, for example. Um, so on the clay colored sparrow, this is a just spot on ID characteristic for this particular species. So it's important to notice um, the color of the nape of the neck. And wing bars, um, folks that study birds talk about wing bars all the time. And sometimes um, in some species, it's like, did they have a wing bar or not? Because that's the thing that's gonna differentiate between two species. So some things to look at. Um, here, I just wanted to give kind of a extreme example, um, the Eastern versus the spotted tohi. And you can certainly see um, based on the pattern of the back and wings is, is exactly how we differentiate between these two. And this is a big sparrow, by the way the biggest. So it was really hard. I, I tried really, really hard to get pictures of birds' tails in flight. But typically what that means for us as birders or bird researchers is that there's a bird that's flying away and you have a really bad view of it and whatever picture you might have managed to get is probably really terrible and you're just going to delete it and not share it with anyone. Um, but I did hope to point out to you that looking at um, the colors and patterns of tail feathers, as you can see here, these are fairly extreme examples. A lot of times you want to look for whether or not there's a prominent amount of white on the outer tail feathers. Um, the slate colored junco, who is a very common winter resident here, or wintering species here in Missouri, um, is probably the most extreme example of this. It's really easy to tell them flying away because of those prominently white outer tail feathers. Um, our Vesper Sparrow has them as well and not not all the sparrows do. So another thing that I hoped to illustrate with this picture is, is a big difference between tail lengths and shapes. Um, and again, I, I, didn't, I couldn't get pictures of birds flying away, but this is what you will see when they are flying away. So it can, it can help you. Um, the Henslow sparrow there on the left clearly has a shorter tail to body ratio, a much pointier wing, uh, tail projection as opposed to uh, kind of a white throated sparrow there on the right has a rounded tail. It's much longer in comparison to their body. And these are things that you will be able to notice. So that can help you a lot. Um, for example, in a prairie, if you see a bird flying away from you and it has a relatively long tail and it's kind of pumping that tail, it's not a Henslow sparrow. It's probably a song sparrow. So those things, as obscure as they might sound, are helpful in the field. Um, so your field guide is your friend. Paige says your field guide is your best friend. Um, it will do things like point out these things that I've been talking about. Um, and so it's always a nice idea if you're going to a particular habitat to maybe look at these sorts of descriptions before you go out. Um, and of course, you can see range maps also really help. Um, there's a lot of power in expecting something to see something. And I've fallen prey to that myself, uh, thinking, you know, I'm gonna go out 
you know, maybe see a Hedgelow Sparrow, but it's really late in the season and it's really probably more likely that I'm going to be looking at a Lecomte Sparrow. Um, so trying to divest yourself of preconceived notions. Finally, um, and this is, you know, Zeb and, and ETH are going to get into this, but sometimes sparrows are just easier by sound. <laughs> um, so a lot of times our species of sparrow look very, very similar, um, but their calls are very, their calls and songs are very, very different. So I'm going to play these two um, different songs. Here's Field Sparrow first. It's going to be the ping pong ball sounding song. So there's a field sparrow and here's the grasshopper sparrow. and hence the grasshopper sparrow's name. But you can see these two birds do look different, but their songs maybe are even more different. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Zeb. Thank you, Dana. Sorry about that. I had a slight computer glitch going on. I am going to share my screen here really quick. All right. So as Dana said, um, a lot of those sparrows, if you get the chance just to see their tail feathers and none of the identification marks, it can be really difficult to get the ID. So maybe you can rely on their calls or their songs. So birds make a couple of different types of sounds, typically there's calls which are a little bit shorter, and I'll explain more in detail in a second. It should sound like this. Hopefully this audio comes through. So there's calls, and then there are bird songs, which sound more like this. All right, um, so both have, to the best of our knowledge, a few particular purposes. Both calls and songs communicate different things for birds. Um, I also want to note here um, at this point that these recordings I've taken are from Zeno Canto, which is an open source free um, bird sounds website that you can upload your own audio recordings to, and you can explore different sounds from your area on that. Uh, myself or Paige will put that link in the chat later on at the end of this webinar. Um, so calls, back to calls, calls are used to alert others, such as um, particularly alarm calls or distress calls. Um, they can also be used to like set up a territory or like let others know that an alert that they are encroaching on their territory. Typically both sexes of birds call, so as a result they can both be used for pair bonding. And songs, on the other hand, are typically just done by the male, but there are a few species where the females sing as well. Um, so in result of this, since calls are by both species and they're not necessarily for attracting mates, calls occur year round, whereas songs occur typically more in the breeding season. So when they're setting up a territory and when they are um, trying to woo a mate. So as a result, songs are seasonal and not as common as calls, but they're much more easy to identify. And so now I want to get into more of the importance of birding by sound. Um, sound is a crucial aspect of birding. Most birds produce many different sounds, but, um, but there's specific things that you can key in to ID um, a bird to the species. Um, and for example, in our surveys and in general, when I'm doing my birding, most of my detections are done by sound ID before I get to see the bird because they are flitting around in a tree or something or deep in the grass, like pictured here. Um, some, some notes about sound ID, it does require some ear training. So like any musical endeavor, practice makes perfect. So practicing makes it better. Um, personally, for me, I feel most comfortable when I, memorizing a call to the species. I get the opportunity to watch them make the sound. So if you do 
catch a bird, you see hear where it's coming from and you see it and it does happen to pop up and you can watch it make its call. That really helps me personally, like it kind of crystallizes what bird is making that sound. And then if you can't, if you don't have that opportunity, there are recordings available online in several field apps, such as Audubon app or the Merlin bird ID, you can use that to confirm an identification. And then there are also um, CD sets or MP3 sets like the Stokes Field Guide, where they list, they have a collection of bird songs and calls um, in your, for your area. So, um, as I said, there are several different things to think about when you're identifying birds by sound. And then in general, they're a really powerful tool for bird identification. In some cases, sound may be the only way to differentiate. So these, these two pictures here are two separate species. Um, there are slight differences. You might be able to identify it, but the sound is going to be a much better giveaway. And then for these two, these two species, these are also different birds. It's really, really, really hard to identify visually. So the sounds are um, really beneficial in making that identification. Um, another clue for these birds would be identifying by differentiating what they occur in their range, but unfortunately Missouri where we're all based is one of the places that their range overlaps, so you can have both of them. So I'm going to go back to the first examples here, and again I'm going to play some audio and hopefully it comes through. So the first one, these are two different species of woodpeckers, uh, the downy woodpecker and the hairy woodpecker. So the downy woodpecker is what I'm going to play first, which is why the, the um, speaker is coming from that bird. I'll play. It, I'll try and play it one more time. Hopefully that comes through. Uh, one more time. We'll see if it goes better. Or maybe not. There we go. Okay, hopefully it came through. Um, it should sound like a really high pitched whinny um, that descends in pitch as the call goes on. Now, in contrast, we have the hairy woodpecker. It'll sound more like this. Cool, I think I got nods from my um, co-presenters that that one came through a little bit better. Um, again, you can look these up on the field guides as well to kind of get a better idea. But the hairy woodpecker, is actually slightly bigger, so it sounds like it has a little bit deeper of a voice too. Um, and the main differentiation though to key in on when you're identifying between the two is that the pitch of the hairy woodpecker's call does not descend over the course, where the, winnie, the downy sounds like it's kind of going downhill. The woodpecker, it, the sound is the same, the hairy woodpecker has the same sound across the call. Okay, so now to the other two examples I, I have here. We've got the western and eastern red alert. These are these two species here presented here. And the Western sounds like this. Got a couple more now that one came through again. Okay. So, and then after the Western, we've got the Eastern metal arc. And this one is more common in Missouri, but both of them do occur here. All right, so one thing I want to bring up with this one is for the Eastern Meadowlark, we have what's called a mnemonic or a memory device that can help you associate the sound with a, a, a name or a term or something to help you better memorize it. And they say that the Eastern Meadowlark sounds like it's saying, see you, see your. Um, so something like that, it helps you remind, or, like, remind yourself what it's supposed to sound like. If you can kind of match these, these words to a bird song, it can help you memorize them. Um, other terminology that we use to identify bird songs or calls, um, it's more like an onomatopoeia, or so that just sounds like it's a buzz or a trill or something like that, which I'm going to leave to Ethan to get more into detail about the specific um, terms that we use when we're talking about bird song ID. Um, and then to wrap up my section, um, I hinted at the beginning that the, there are differences between songs and calls. And singing is typically easier to identify, but it is seasonal, so timing is going to be important to think about that. Singing also occurs mostly at dawn and dusk, and this is because birds have a photoperiod clock. At these times of year, it makes them tune into the breeding season or think they're going to start flying for migration, so they kind of change their behavior. Um, so at, at those times of the day, it's most um, important that the, the birds are singing and setting up their territory when everybody else is awake in the area. Um, and then the greatest singing is in the spring, but because the photo period is similar in the fall, there's quite a bit of singing that does occur in the fall as well. 
Whereas calling can occur throughout the day, um, especially when food or predators are nearby. There's a lot of different things that communicate, communicate through calls, so it's not as specific as song, but the calls are such, so much shorter, they're typically harder to ID. Uh, that's kind of the main things I wanted to talk about with the timing here. Um, and I think that's all I've got. So, yep, what I will do is I will stop sharing and I will pass it off to Ethan to talk more about um, song ID. Thank you, Zeb. I start sharing my screen now. We should be able to see this presentation. So yes, it's pretty neat getting into the bird song aspect of things. It really helps to be able to. Um, Pardon me. You yep. still have this thing on there, so you have to. Thank you. Thank you. She said some of my pallets were still visible, so I'm gonna move those out of the way real quick. That should do it. Okay, doke. Yeah, so um, yeah, there's there's a lot to uh, understanding um, bird song, um, and one thing that may help you, and I'll just get into this a little bit, um, is learning how to look at sound and sort of how to talk about it, uh, because there's a lot of variation within the bird world, and um, like Dana mentioned with the sparrows, you know, that can be very helpful uh, for for those tricky birds. And for the warblers, as colorful as they are, warblers are really, um, uh, they're, they're difficult to see oftentimes in the spring and oftentimes they're, they're up in the trees or in thick cover. So um, first learn how to see sounds. Um, we're looking now at a, a sound spectrogram. And the sound spectrogram has a couple different um, metrics on it that you should be familiar with and so this up and down here is your pitch or your frequency sounds that are really high sounds that are really low um, and then the, the other axes here is the time so uh, the length of any particular song so th this particular example here is um is not a warbler although it does sort of warble doesn't it that's uh, a common song that a lot of people hear, they might be familiar with. That's the American Robin, actually. Um, we'll, we'll pull up um, uh, another song here and look at it and think about it in terms and terminology of the structure of the song. And so look at that thing. What, 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 what are you thinking there? What might that even sound like, if you can imagine what that would sound like? Well, I'll just sort of show you some, some elements of it. But first, I want to explain that this bird is actually a pine warbler that I recorded in Rala. And this is available on Xeno Canto, which De Zeb mentioned earlier as well. Um, so in any event, we want to give credit to the actual individual bird that sang the song down in Rala with our friends, their master nationals down there. So the elements of the song you can think about, the structural elements are these. Each one of these particular little notes, you might say, or unit is an element. And so we'll just start with that. And so you can see that there are different elements with that song. And then when they're all run together, you can hear that. It's actually a trill. A nice little trill by pine warblers that are now re returning back up here. And, um, so those are elements. And then you can think of the larger sections here. Um, so this bird, by the way, I'm gonna throw this out there, is a Northern Perula from our backyard, who is also on Zeno Canto. So we can all give that bird some applause after we're done listening to it. But um, the this, Bird, I'll show you an example of phrases. So the first thing we saw was elements. So you can see that there's a bunch of little elements here like there were with the pine warbler, but there's a phrase and there's another phrase. So it's just sort of ways to break up the song. So when you're listening to a bird, you can say, ah, it's got this trill thing, it's got this one phrase, and then it's got this other thing. So let's listen to it and see what it sounds like. And you could probably note that that was a much faster trill than the pine warbler. 
So those are just a, a little teaser into it and, and maybe something helpful for you. Um, you can look up bird sound spectrograms on Xenocanto of any species you hear. Um, you can also see them oftentimes on All About Birds on Cornell's website and there's other resources out there to look at sound spectrograms. And later on in our webinar series, I'll be talking a little bit more advanced about it, how you can actually go out and get your own recordings if you'd like, and how to look at, look at birdsong and a little bit more in depth in the lexicon about uh, a bird song terminology. Uh, so that, that's all that I have. Uh, any questions you have, have, I can answer them towards the end as well. And I think we'll, Paige, we'll, we'll wrap it up. I'll stop sharing now. Yeah, thank you guys. And, um, and Zeb was awesome and put that Zeno Canto website that they both, um, both Zeb and Ethan referred to in the chat box, chat box there for you guys um, to check out later. Um, I think while I'm gonna share a few more slides with you guys, um, but before I do that, I do wanna say like, you just got a lot of information. Um, and if you're feeling overwhelmed, like I was at the beginning of learning how to do bird ID, remember that you're doing it because it's fun. It's like this puzzle that you're trying to figure out. And so if you're ever like, oh my gosh, I just can't figure out what that is, take a deep breath and be like, that's okay. Or ask a friend or something like that. Don't go through it alone. <laughs> Um, the last thing that we'll talk about um, that we just want to briefly go over. Um, so the American Birding Association has a code of ethics um, for birders to follow while they're doing that to not only benefit birds, but also for the benefit of the birds and for the benefit of other birders in your same area. And they gave a specific ethical um, like code to follow, particularly for um, in the midst of COVID-19 as well, and maintaining social distancing. And the title of that kind of revision was, you know, keep your eyes on the sky, but your butt close to home, um, which is quite fun. And I just kind of, I'm just going to summarize some of the points they made within that. And I'll share the link to that um, website with that code of ethics for you guys. Um, after I finish talking to because I think it's really good for you guys to review. Um, but essentially what they talked about is just like birding is a great thing to do. It's great for your health. It's very fun um, and is definitely worth pursuing. Um, but to while you're birding, being aware of social distancing guidelines and making sure you're still maintaining that social distance from other people um, and different things like that. Um, as well as yeah, some other things that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and also there's no one size fits all prescription for what that means for social distancing. So depending on everybody's situation, whether you live rurally or in an apartment, some of these birding ethics may look different to you. Um, and also a big thing that they recommend and that we recommend too is staying as close to home as possible um, because even driving, um, somewhere far away, um, you can, you're risking getting in an accident. And so what the idea is, is if you stay close to home, you can reduce the potential to require emergency services, which to like prevent going to the hospital and overcrowding those um, as well. Um, and another point that they make is people's judgment of what is safe will vary. So um, use your best judgment, um, but be aware to you almost have to account for your own if people aren't following the same guidelines as you feel safe with um, to maybe account for those in certain ways too. But in short, they may mainly say bird as much as you are able to stay close to home and without exposing yourself or anyone else to risk. So trying to keep it simple. So yeah, so those are just some things and I'll put the link that goes through more of those points in detail if you were confused by any one of them. Um, but essentially, uh, we're glad that you guys came with us today um, and we hope you got some new tools to help you with some bird identification um, and at least get started with birdsong. Um, that is, I'm still on my bird identification, birdsong and vocalization identification practice, so it can take a while, but it's really rewarding um, and very fun and good for your health. 
So now we'll take some questions. We're doing great on time. Um, so we have a lot of time to take any questions you have about bird ID. Um, I'll also put our emails in the chat box um, in case you have, or maybe I'll just put my email in there and then I'll forward it on to people if need be, um, if you have any questions that we don't get to today. <laughs> oh, looks like we have. Calls versus songs. So I'm gonna go ahead and put all of us up on everyone's screen. I think now we can all talk together. Songs versus calls are really, uh, was in Zeb's slide there. And uh, maybe he wants to answer that, but it's really not a black and white thing. There's some gray areas there. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was addressing something for our panel quickly. So the main things with the hey, Zeb, song, I think you're muted. I muted? No, I can hear him. You guys both muted each other? Okay, sorry, we had a, a little just technical stuff. We're, I think we're good now. Okay, so yeah, with calls and songs, um, calls are a lot harder to identify uh, to those species because something that sounds like that's just a really short cheap or chip chip. Uh, can be really hard to identify versus the song is really unique. Um, songs though are only half of the birds out there are going to be singing. Um, so that that's a limiting factor. If you see a bird and it's and you um, are hoping for it to sing, it may not. Um, if you don't know, if you can't tell if it's a male or a female, because some birds they look the same. So uh, I think I, I suggest starting off with song ID because they're easier to identify but it's not as prevalent as the call and the calls can be really challenging, but every bird does make some sort of call. And of course, some birds have different calls when they're juveniles too, just to throw in some more variety in the mix. Um, hopefully that kind of helps address it. Um, and if, if we, anybody else wants to elaborate, they are free to do so. I think you got it. <laughs> Um, so another question is, are there any easy tips for identifying mimics without seeing them? My answer is I, have, I don't got anything for you other than like some of them, you're like, that is the right pattern and sort of right pitch for that call or song, but it's weird. <laughs> That's a, exactly right. It's a it's a matter of patterns. That's the best way to pin them out. If you can't see a mimic, and you're wondering if it's a mimic, you have that hunch. It's because of the pattern. And just know that our mimics, whether it's a brown thrasher, mockingbird, catbirds, some other birds like uh, white-headed vireos even have a little mimicking ability. But just know those patterns. And and the best thing you can do is once you can see a bird singing and you're watching these birds sing. Um, just just enjoy it because the more you watch them, the more it just gets ingrained. And look at him. But yeah, Paige, you pretty much got that one. Yeah. Um, I will elaborate since I think we have the time. The specific patterns to key on for the mimics in our area. Um, thrashers typically when they're mimicking something, they mimic it in pairs of two. And then uh, mockingbirds are the one of the other common mimics. They don't have the same um, consistency with like mimicking something twice, then moving on to another song. Um, cat birds, they often throw in that cat-like call during their um, song, when they're mimicking. So that's the key identification for those guys. Um, and then basically for my personal uh, recommendation for mockingbirds, if it's not doing one of those two things, it's, hopefully it's, you can get a chance to look at the coloration too, but I would kind of like it's probably a mockingbird if it's not doing the characteristics of the other ones. Ethan did mention there are a couple of other birds that are mimics in our area, and one I also want to throw in is a uh, yellow-breasted chat. That's a fun one. I was on a survey and it was doing a perfect upland sandpiper call, but then I saw it and it's like upland sandpipers are not yellow. So there are, if you, it's a really nice when you can see at least a couple different marks, if you can try and try and get a, just the slightest look at, a, at one of the mimics that can help differentiate them. Habitat house. Uh, and then and one then more bird add more throw, add throw in the non native. It is it a is great mimic, it is the European starling. And they can, and there's no patterning with them. They're just, maybe if you're lucky, it'll mimic some other things while you're there. And you'll be like, well, I'm in the middle of downtown and there's no way there's a bobwhite quail up there, even though it sounds like a perfect bobwhite quail.
Right. So that other context with identifying birds comes into play with mimics too. So it's one of those things where I think what's cool about mimics is once you learn what all the species and their songs and calls sound like and you get better at that, what's fun about mimics is you begin to recognize, oh, that's a mimic. That's not a bird doing its own call. So it like, I don't know, that's really fun for me. Um, but yeah, so I think we all gave, I think that's a pretty good answer. Um, so the next question, is there a place we can go to find calls or songs in word terms? Like what it sounds like? Yes, there is. Do you guys want to cover those resources? I have a book that I'm going to go grab right now to show. <laughs> Um, a lot of the, for the birds that have really specific ones, field guides will show them, um, and then the online field guides will show that as well. I'm sure there are better repositories as pages got one right in our hands here that should be really useful. So this is one that I have, and it's called the Peterson Field Guide to Bird Songs of Eastern North America. And if you open it up, so Ethan showed you guys that spectrogram. So it kind of has those similar things as well as um, like the, some of the mnemonics that um, some like common ones that birders use. Um, so for example, like the white-throated sparrow, we'll stick with sparrows, says, oh sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. And once you learn that, and they'll change it up sometimes too, but once you learn that like basic thing. Um, so this is one thing. Um, I believe on Zeno Canto, when you look up a bird recording, it has, most of them have the spectrogram as well. Is that correct? <laughs> and then um, a lot of field, I think Zeb might've just said this too, but a lot of field guides have like descriptions of the songs in like the bird description. But I think that's really hard to learn your songs by, but <laughs> personally. <laughs> No, no, it's unmuted. I'll, I'll show this. Uh, here's a few apps that are available. And I'm going to go to the Sibley app and just pull up a bird really quickly. I'll pull up, say, a common yellow throat. Just like in the field guides in the text version, they'll have the illustrations, they'll have the range maps, the songs. And also they'll have the, um, they'll also have the description here of the bird. It should show me there. And you can see under sounds, it says, song is a gentle musical whistle and repeated phrases of three to five syllables, witchity, witchity. I think they say witchity, witchity, witch. But that's what they sound like. And then you can also play them here. So that's, that's, that's how that works. Can you guys hear it okay? Maybe. So anyway, they'll stop that share, but that's another, another way to find the words for their, their songs. Yeah, and that can be a great journaling opportunity too. So like Ethan said, like, oh, this is what this says it sounds like, but I think it sounds like this. So like that can be fun to like, even if you just go through and like listen to some recordings and then being like, well, hmm, I think that kind of sounds like it. So making your own spectrogram that makes sense to you in your journal too. Um, I think that helped me out when I really first started learning. Um, if you have the time and the interest to do that, because that could take a lot of time, <laughs> but could be really fun. <laughs> um, so next question, can you whistle and have a bird answer? I like to think when I whistle, when a bird is calling, it's answering me, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so this is probably a great opportunity to discuss um, the concepts of using our own voices or using a recording um, to encourage, shall we say, birds to come closer to you. Um, and this is something that is debated amongst the birding community um, because for a variety of reasons, um, it can be a good tool, particularly in a research setting um, if you're studying a rare species, for instance, and you really aren't sure if it is occupying a site or a habitat, um, sometimes the only way to really document that is to play the bird's call or song and hopefully have it respond. I mean, there's no guarantee that it will. Um, 
but bird watchers have a variety of ways of doing this. Um, and I welcome comments from my co-presenters, but I've definitely seen this overused and I don't necessarily think that that's what the question was about from the beginning when you said whistle and have them come in. I do, I do think birds will, will respond to a nice whistle and I've certainly seen people call back and forth with bar dolls. Um, but I'm more talking about in a sense of trying to bring particularly a breeding bird out into the open to be able to see it by using some sort of um, human made uh, song device, whether that's yourself or um, a, you know, a phone playback or something like that. So um, I just think it's something that should be used sparingly. Um, but whistling conversations with the birds in your backyard is a different and more pleasant thing. So if anybody else wants to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's it's good, good to bring up that ethical point. And the American Birding Association has it on that website we mentioned earlier. earlier. And yeah. um, you, you can, can really, really mess up a bird if you're like playing, playing their song on your phone. phone. It's during breeding season, season they've, they've done studies on that and that affects their cortisol levels, levels for like 25 minutes or something like that. So it makes them waste energy and makes them more exposed to predators and things. So um, like and then oftentimes people will find a rare bird and go try to everybody try to locate it by playing its songs. So those birds get getting harassed all day, and this is like ah, I'm just getting harassed all day. So um, we also have a question in the chat um, and a comment, and I appreciate that comment um, about the ethics of of using recorded song in the field. Um, but the questions refer to size and how much, how much do you rely on size to narrow down? Um, and then do you have a tip on not overestimating when the bird is far away and you're using binoculars? I think that this is a really great question. Um, how much do you rely on size to narrow down? I would say very little. Um, that's a really, I, I, sh I will say I try to use it very little. It's a, it's a con you know, it's a very common habit to say, oh, it's small, it's big, it, you know, oh, it was huge flying overhead. But I, I have been um, mistaken many, many times because of an overestimation or an underestimation of size. Um, I think that an awesome example of this is the downy and hairy woodpeckers that Zeb talked about a little bit. Um, if you see them together, the downy is very noticeably substantially smaller than the hairy woodpecker. But if I've seen them many times apart and I'm like, is that a, is that a hairy or is it a really big downy? I mean, there's just, there's really no way to tell. Um, so if I had to give it a, a percentage of importance in my personal birding, 20% maybe. I mean, I, I, I do it, but I, it's not definitive. I will. So I would add to that. I completely agree with Dana. I think, yeah, but I do think that essentially what size helps is like a snap. It's like when Dana uses it, it's really quick. Cause it's like, Oh, that's clearly not an Eagle, <laughs> you know, cause it's only this big, like, um, and like, or, you know, it used very minimally, but it is quick to like narrow down your group. Like it's def it's more used to like be like, this is the group I'm in and not necessarily the specific species, at least for me. I think that's how I use it more often. Cause yeah, when you're getting into, is it this species or this species? Well, you're probably talking about pretty similar birds and the size difference again, like I think a common one, the trap that I fall into all the time is Cooper's hawk versus sharp shinned hawk, yeah. um, which look insanely similar. So I'm like, size is the factor that I need to look, but it's tough. <laughs> but it does get easier over time. But that's a great question. Um, I don't know if either anyone else has anything to add, but that was my point is just, yeah, it's very quick, I think to narrow to group and not think, really individual. <laughs> I think you're making a really, really good point because unless, if you're trying to get it between two species, but if it's like, 
is that brown streaky thing that I'm seeing over there, is it a house wren, you know, or is it a red-tailed hawk and I'm just not seeing the tail and I'm seeing the back and it's brown and white? Like, in that case, for sure, you're using size and, and using it appropriately. So I guess with a, a tip for that is if you're looking through binoculars and trying to estimate the size, if there's anything else in the peripheral with the bird, like the size of a leaf or something that you know the, the general size of in comparison you can use to help kind of frame what size the bird actually is. But if you're looking straight up in the sky, like the clouds don't really help you. So I was going to say like, if I'm relying on size for like looking at a silhouette or something I can't see color or shape, then I'm just there's, I'm just gonna guess I don't know what it actually is. I'm, I'm not gonna be confident in my ID on that. So that's when it's, it's really challenging. Yeah, great answers, Ev. Way to answer the whole question. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all the questions we have um, in the box, in the chat and the question and the answer so far. So. If you have a question, now's the time to post it. Um, otherwise, we're coming up on 6.30 pretty soon here. Um, um, so I'll just thank you all for coming. Um, we have a lot of fun doing these webinars. Um, and the next one coming up is the wonders of bird migration on May 5th. Um, so if you've been curious uh, how birds migrate, how far do they go. Um, I think what's really fun about this time of year is that birds that spend the winter in South and Central America are now showing up again. Um, I saw my first indigo bunting at the feeder today. And so that can be really cool. And to learn um, how those birds do that is really fascinating um, and a good way to connect to other people all over the world, like I said at the beginning. So, but, oh, I see a question. <laughs> oh. Talking migration, when do hummingbirds typically get to Missouri? Um, great question. Now, <laughs> um, right, like kind of end of April. Yep. Beginning they've of been, April, still very year to year, but. <laughs> they've definitely been showing up in many, many places in Missouri um, including up to the northern part of the state in the last week. So they're here. They may not be here in the numbers that they're going to be in, in another week or so, but definitely the first ones have arrived. Well, Lanny Chambers, who's a preeminent hummingbird uh, expert in the state, um, had his first female hummingbird show up. Usually the males show up a little quicker, but he had his first females just, just show up. Yeah. That's cool. The males, yeah, usually. Good question. So just to, I guess, maybe wrap it up and, and mention, this page mentioned the wonders of migration webinar. Um, the, as far as peak of the songbird migration, so the orioles and the warblers and the hummingbirds and, and buntings, as Paige mentioned, um, it's basically now now through about mid-May or so. Um, birds are coming in big numbers. A fun thing to do is if you just Google something like migrating birds on radar, um, there are so many, many hundreds of thousands of birds or millions of birds migrating right now that, that weather radar picks them up um, and they, they look like big blobs of clouds basically. Um, so this is it's an exciting time. That's, that's so that looks like a page posted a link to our, to our next, next webinars, webinars there at verbo.org slash verbo dash webinar. Yep. And I guess with that, we'll wrap it up. Thanks so much, everybody. And hopefully we'll, we'll see you. Email us with any questions. Enjoy your birds. Bye. <laughs>